Thank you. I've never gotten such a rock star applause. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Thank you so much to Jeff uh, Dama for um, inviting me to give a talk as part of um, the International Festival of Arts and Ideas. It's very exciting to be here. Um, and I'm very glad that we could have Milad and Mehdi with us, the um, Tehran Vocal Ensemble, who will be um, uh, entering into a conversation with me after a talk that I will be giving on the topic of Islam and music, the case of Iran. I'll enter into a conversation with them and subsequently we'll have a short sort of 10 minute Q&A um, and then uh, the ensemble will perform two pieces for us from Tehran, live from Tehran, yes, right here in New Haven. Um, so as most of you know, um, Iran was a secular monarchy um, reigned by the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, uh, when in 1978, about 40 years ago, momentum gathered, and in February 1979, the revolutionary succeeded to topple the Shah. Soon, the spiritual leader, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, um, whom uh, many revolutionaries of different political pers persuasions had united around, returned to Iran from exile and was declared, um, and so Iran was declared an Islamic Republic. This was obviously a big break from the previous system of government and the new Islamic regulations applied to all aspects of life, cultural, social, political, and so on. A few months into the success of the revolution in July 1979, um, the all-powerful new leader Ayatollah Khomeini shared his views on music um, in a speech to state radio employees. I have a sort of a longer segment just to, so you get an idea for his, you know, a real sort of insight into his thinking. He said, one of the things that intoxicate the brains of our youth is music. Music causes the human brain, after one listens to it for some time, to become inactive and superficial and one loses seriousness. Of course, music is a matter that everyone naturally likes, but it takes the human being out of the realm of seriousness and draws him toward uselessness and futility. <laughs> I'm loving the laughter and response. Um, a youth that spends most of his time on music becomes negligent of life issues and serious matters and becomes addicted, just like someone who becomes addicted to drugs. And a drug addict can no longer be a serious human being who can think about political issues. Now, you must take these issues seriously and turn away from jokes and light matters. Don't laugh at this. Now, <laughs> there's no difference between music and opium. Opium brings a sort of apathy and numbness, and so does music. If you want your country to be independent from now on, you must transform radio and television into educational instruments. Eliminate music. It's a longer segment that I chose to um, sort of uh, include in my talk, but there's a shorter one that was, in the, that was printed all over the newspapers. Eliminate music completely. So in the new Islamic Republic, music was to be neglected, if not eliminated altogether. Most kinds of music were soon prohibited on radio and television. Music schools were shut down, and musicians, especially female singers, were, were told they could no longer perform, um, that it was forbidden by Islamic law. And soon the new state prohibited the import of cassette and video tapes and recorders. This state, this by the way, does not mean that there wasn't a ton of content to acquire by all kinds of means. Iranians continue to travel and um, have a lot of links to the outside world. A lot of their families live abroad, so this does not mean that there was a vacuum, uh, you know, and sort of an absence of these things. But that, those were the state regulations. Um, and the state regularly deployed its forces at the time known as the Comité or Basij, who conf confiscated such equipment from cars and homes and punished their owners um, with lashes or fines. And the, the punishments have become, became less and less severe as the time went on. In the first decade of the Islamic Republic, when thousands of young men were falling in the Iran-Iraq war, so following the Islamic Revolution in 1979, Saddam Hussein's Iraq attacked Iran, and from 1980 to 1988, there was a war that has been called the longest conventional war of the 20th century. Um, about a million people died on both sides. And during this war, the only tunes broadcast on state television were march music or patriotic hymns, um, hymns and songs, and religious lamentation. 
To give you a sense for the ideal kind of uh, musical piece um, that this new revolutionary state demanded, I want, to, um, I want to play for you the first piece that was broadcast on state radio. So once the revolutionaries had taken over the state airwaves, um, this was the first piece that was broadcast to represent what this new revolutionary state stood for. It was Reza Rugeri's Iran Iran, which melds Iran with Islam in equal measure um, and really perfectly embodies the aesthetic ideals um, of the revolutionary hymn at the time. There's no rhythmical instrumental music. It's in the form of a choir um, and I ideally contains only male voices. Um, I have a short excerpt for you here. Allah, Allah, Allah. But things really took a turn when one of Khomeini's dearest disciples, Ayatollah Murtaza Mutahari, was assassinated and revolutionaries involved um, in state media produced a song uh, for the first year commemoration of this, um, of this uh, Ayatollah who was very close to Imam Khomeini. Uh, to test the waters, the officials in charge of the song's production first had the song be played for Khomeini himself. And after having listened to the song, he asked to see the makers of the song. Um, in in uh, the visit with the makers of the song, he told them, I could not stop my tears when I heard your song. I don't cry much, but I cried when I heard your song. This is the best and most beautiful music that I've heard. And if you continue like this, I will support you. So um, the song, which I will also play a short excerpt from was the first state commissioned song um, that was musically based in the Persian repertoire, the Radif. Um, the song is called Shahid Mutahar, the Pure Martyr. It's a play on the on the name of um, of the name of uh, of um, the the assassinated Ayatollah. <laughs> Sorry, the volume, reduce it. I'm not sure, can I, uh, how, how to do that? Sure, reduce it, yes, yes, it's a bit loud. Um, so, you know, with that statement from Khomeini, really the notion of committed music was born. There was a whole new concept of what kind of music was actually okay, and uh, just to tell you a little bit about the sensitivities around music, and this was not just sort of the leading ayatollahs, it was more widespread among especially Islamic revolutionaries who really wanted to bring this wholesale change to Iranian society. Um, I was at a 2011 um, panel discussion as part of the country's Fajr Music Festival, which, which is an annual music festival, and a sociologist by the name of Azamir Avadrad um, told the story of how she was underway on some road trip with her, uh, with her companions, and she said, you know, we were really depsh, we were really hardcore Hezbollahis, um, the, the kind who were 100% committed to every single word of Khomeini's. And they stopped somewhere for lunch, and this piece of music was broadcast on state television, and one of her friends felt such social responsibility that she just jumped and turned off state television. She couldn't believe, even though it was on state television, that it could have been uh, with, uh, with the approval of the state. It must have been a mistake. Um, so that's, that's sort of, you know, and, and the song is by no means sort of a dance uh, or rock song. It's, uh, it's quite, you know, uh, wholesome as far as um, Iranian sensibilities are concerned. But subsequently, once Khomeini's view on the issue was known, um, those who followed him um, uh, towed the line. So this anecdote, of course, demonstrates also an astounding flexibility on behalf of Khomeini and by extension of the Islamic Republic early on. How do we explain this? How do we reconcile this with Khomeini's statement only a year earlier that all music was to be eliminated? 
The permissibility of music according to Islam has always been a matter of interpretation, and views have ranged from full negation to permission of all music and instruments, including dance. This is across Islamic countries, and some, there are very strict measures against it, and in some, it's, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of music are allowed. Since the ultimate authority in Islam, the Quran, does not mention music explicitly, and the sunnah, so the traditions uh, of the practices and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad as recorded through hadiths, uh, the sayings, um, offer little clarity on the subject, Muslim scholars and authorities have interpreted various verses in the Quran according to their own points of view. Most of the Islamic discussion has revolved around three Quranic verses where abstention from lahb al-hadith, idle talk, is advised, which conservative Islamic um, scholars have interpreted to mean music, um, including music, espousing the view um, that music is futile folly. However, some of the most important and influential theoreticians on music, such as al-Ghazali, al-Farabi, and Avicenna, uh, all of whom happen to be of Persianate origin, viewed music favorably. Al-Ghazali's work on music, which many other scholars followed as a model, concluded that both statutory and analogous evidence indicate the admissibility of music. A major point in his argumentation, which has been since um, replicated by authorities within the Islamic Republic, is that the impression that music leaves on the heart follows the rule of what is in the heart. That, in effect, means that the intention of the listener really determines his perception and his reception of a piece of music. So if you have a good heart and you listen with good intentions in a good context, um, the effect of that music will be different than when you have bad intentions and just as a person perhaps are in a context in which you're open to uh, negative perceptions of a certain piece of music. Despite Khomeini's harsh pronouncement on music at the beginning of his reign, his view on music uh, was actually closer to al-Ghazali's. One of the main architects of the constitution of the Islamic Republic and a close ally of Khomeini, Ayatollah Muhammad Beheshti, had laid this view out very clearly in speeches made almost a decade before the revolution um, in a mosque in Germany. In response to questions about the legality of music, he had responded, not all singing is haram, not all instrument playing is haram. Those kinds of singing and instrumental music are haram that draw listeners or the audience in a gathering towards sin. That is considered laugh, idle entertainment or play, which makes the human being heedless of God's remembrance. But how is it decided what type of effect a kind of music has, aside from the personal reception? Here Khomeini's views against, uh, again uh, overlap with al-Azali's um, of, the, of the reflection in the heart. So it effect, in effect, it appears that Khomeini placed responsibility for discerning the effect and hence permissibility of different kinds of music on the individual, at least within the already regulated framework of the Islamic Republic. Furthermore, in response to numerous estifta, which are religious sort of questionnaires that any person can send to um, ayatollahs and sources of emulation, you can ask uh, questions on any matters, and in fact, uh, quite banal questions are asked to very sort of highly sort of complex questions as well. Um, in, in those questionnaires, uh, Khomeini and most ulama, and including the current supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, have responded in line with Ghazali and Beheshti. Often they have further explicated that it is orf, meaning convention or custom, that determines which music distances one from God and which does not. So on the one hand, statements that music's effect could be variably judged by listeners or on the basis of custom and convention can't really be practically carried out in an authoritarian political system if we were to take the term orf or convention at face value. The state, of course, officially controls music and does not leave its judgment up to each listener. Equally, in the absence of a free public sphere, no truly popular customs or conventions or laws can be debated and established. And the highest ulama have never unanimously agreed on one custom or convention to apply to all. This is not the job of ulama. They're basically scholars in different universities who study a lifelong in order to lend their own interpretations to the original texts. As to the state and government bodies that regulate the production and distribution of music, they too have to make do with these ambiguous edicts. And so the field of music regulation remains a Kafkaesque labyrinth that uh, causes a lot of 
frustration, consternation to most artists, including, I imagine, Mehdi and Milad, um, listening to us here from Tehran. This interpretational ambivalence, as well as a lack of resolve or action on behalf of the country's highest leaders, has created an atmosphere of uncertainty regarding music in post-revolutionary Iran. And so not surprisingly, the most repeated plaintive expression in conversations about music is taklife musiqi roshanist, music is in limbo. But before the revolution's leader died in 1989, about a decade into the revolution, a few important things happened for music. On the one hand, as already, um, uh, as you saw with his edict on that piece that was created for his beloved uh, protege, Khomeini gave birth to the idea of um, the political uh, of the political notion of maslahat, expediency, uh, which has also applied to music in the, decades sin in the decades since. This concept is best understood in retelling an anecdote of a conversation between Khomeini and then-president Akbar Rafsanjani. In a public speech, Khomeini's son Ahmad related a conversation between his father and Rafsanjani, who asked the imam, Previously, you declared that music was forbidden and should be eliminated completely. Why do you no longer object to it? Uh, Khomeini's answer was, let us assume that the music in question was broadcast by the radio of Saudi Arabia. Then I would forbid it, because wherever Taghut, Satan, idol worship is in power, opposition to what he undertakes is allowed, and such opposition confirms to Maslahat. Khomeini had a, he viewed uh, Saudi Arabia as a greater sort of, um, place of Satan and idol worship than even the West. So in this, para, in this um, you know, a comment, he's not saying, imagine this was happening in America. He's saying, imagine this was happening in Saudi Arabia. There, this would not be okay. But here, where the Islamic State is in power, a different form of regulation is valid. So this kind of decision making, where the government's interests overrule other considerations, became an established form of policy making. Um, called expediency. It has been an enduring concept in Islamic Republic um, policy setting, both socially and culturally. The interests of the state overrule even the Sharia. This is something that Khomeini himself has said verbatim. So um, the interests of the survival of the state, whatever is required to um, really be in dialogue to some extent with this uh, large youth bulge and the growing population and um, the needs of the state, that is more important than even what is in the Sharia. By the same token, or according to the same policy, even pop music made a comeback 20 years later, after 20 years after the revolution. Now there was a huge pop music scene in Iran before the revolution, um, but it was regarded by the Islamic revolutionaries as a scene that represented everything that was reprehensible um, about the, the public culture during the reign of the Shah. Uh, the clubs and the cabarets that allowed for men and women to mingle and to consume alcohol. Um, and in the view of the Islamists, um, these were the locations that facilitated, facilitated licentiousness and needed to be eliminated. And so they were. One of the first uh, scenes to have been completely uprooted from Iranian public culture was this pop music uh, um, scene that uh, revolved around certain streets and um, uh, there were very prominent, su super popular musicians, pop stars, most of whom left Iran for LA, which is why Los Angeles has the honorific title of Tehrangelis. So they set up their pop music empire um, in Los Angeles, and a lot of their clientele also left. A lot of those uh, Iranians who would have gone to these clubs and cabarets, not, not all of them, but a lot of them also um, left Iran at the time of the revolution. But 20 years after the revolution, pop music was permitted again. And there are a lot of speculations about the reasons behind the government's decision to permit um, this kind of music. Um, and the prominent and basically accepted narrative is that the Islamic Republic, powerless to control the flow of pop music from Los Angeles in a calculated move, launched young singers, often with voices and styles similar to popular or Los Angeles -y singers, um, um, from before the revolution in order to draw Iranians' attentions away from what is considered, what it considered to be depraved expatriate content and inward toward a more state-controlled um, uh, conforming discourse. 
But in doing research on this, I found that really the opposite was true. The reemergence of pop music happened because of a confluence of factors, including mostly the personal agency of a few young musicians and even fewer officials who were finally persuaded. In fact, the musician who's really credited with having started this flow, Hasher Etemadi, for many years he took his tracks to state television and was told, your voice is too similar to Dariush, the singer in Los Angeles, and so we can't run it. Eventually, he was green-lighted because um, there was an official in state television, Ali Muhammad, Ali Ma'alem Damghani, who uh, really didn't see a problem with that. And in my conversations with people involved in the process, I was told that uh, Ali Ma'alem um, convinced the current Supreme Leader Khamenei that without homemade pop music, Iran's youth would be at greater risk of cultural invasion from abroad. Khamenei is then said to have quietly sought the approval of top Islamic scholars, and uh, now there are so many pop music concerts that, um, um, uh, and, and many of them are sold out. There, you know, there's sometimes two sessions a night of the same singer for ten consecutive nights. Um, so there's so much music in Iran right now. Um, but it didn't plan, or it was really due to the agency of the young musicians who really didn't feel like the music that was coming in from LA reflected their realities of young people coming of age in the Islamic Republic anymore. And the Western music that they were getting was cool, but it also didn't really uh, have much to do with their own lives. And they kept pushing, and finally there was an official, and that you know, does speak to the personal agency of this uh, one official and several people around him who finally said, this is not problematic. We should, we should allow this and we should really co-opt it and, and take control over this. Um, but after the first pop albums were published, we're talking late 90s, um, the first phase of real pop music still traded in ambiguous themes. It was still not okay to sing about love explicitly. When Benjamin, one of the most famous, sang his song Khateraha, which means memories, um, where he talks about uh, closing his eyes and imagining a beloved, the lyrics were vague enough, and the style of singing sort of trailed the religious nohekhuni, the religious singing, um, enough that one could conceive of him actually um, singing about the Mahdi, the Messiah, um, the 12th Imam in Shia Islam. Uh, I'll show you an excerpt. This is uh, Ali Malim Damghani, the official who I mentioned, um, who greenlighted pop music. And this here is Benjamin. <laughs> So by 2005, this kind of music was okay. Um, singers just could not sing about um, any explicitly romantic themes, earthly themes, sexual themes, and certainly nothing political. Today, that is no longer the case. Well, the romantic, as far as the romantic themes are concerned. Um, uh, as long as the themes are not political and very explicitly sexual, everything, uh, really, themes are um, permitted. And more often than not, singers do, in fact, sing about love and betrayal. And Benjamin, uh, about a, uh, you know, seven, eight years later, had a very famous track uh, in which he talks about a woman who would not be interested in him if uh, she knew that he um, is truly in love with her, meaning that the woman, the kind of woman he's really interested in is one who's interested in a more physical kind of relationship with him. And that was okay. That was performed all over um, the stages of the Islamic Republic. Um, but nothing political. Um, and for those of you who've never been uh, to um, a concert in Iran, I just want to give you a sense for uh, what's happening right now. I have Hamid Homayun's Ashagane. This is from 2017. They're very dance pop cons, uh, sort of, you know, very rhythmically fast concerts. And people often have to be um, admonished to sit down because they have a, you know, it's, they just want to get up and dance. That's not allowed. But they are dancing sort of with their upper bodies in the seats. And they're very cross generational. These concerts are not not just attended by young people, they're family affairs. People go out to them across the generations and enjoy this um, sphere of joy and music. And I, I have the 
segment which really shows the audience more than the music, um, just to give you a sense for the audience. Um, so you can see, um, uh, well, you know, from the audience that it's quite um, um, cross-generational. Um, and the music, you can't really distinguish between pop music produced in Tehran and its uh, twin city half a world away, Tehran Jilis, anymore. There are a lot of co collaborations. It's very similar music. Um, producers in Los Angeles will, produ will produce for musicians in Tehran. Songwriters in Tehran will write for musicians in Los Angeles and so on. There's a lot of exchange going on. Uh, and most kinds of music are out there now. The state has more, most, more recently started to co-opt rock music and, um, and uh, other kinds of fusion music. So it's no longer just the, uh, the pop music that's permitted. Also other kinds of rock that used to be underground are now above ground. But one persistent red line has been the band plays against the solo female voice. This is strange for a country like Iran, where prior to the revolution for many decades, um, uh, some of its most popular and beloved singers have been women, and still continue to be. Um, and some of them, such as Iran's most famous pop star of all times, Gugush, uh, continues to give sold out concerts to audiences across the world. And of course, people never stop listening to female musicians in their private spaces. Uh, but following the revolution, as I already mentioned, they were told they can't sing solo. Toward the end of 2014, 2015, the issue of the female solo voice came to the fore in the media, mostly because of two instances, um, two incidents. One was a concert in Bahdad Hall, which involved Mahdi Mohammad Khani, uh, in which she is said to have sung certain segments of a song solo, uh, apparently in the presence of the Minister of Culture. Um, and then there was a CD publication that featured um, only the female singer Nushin Tofi, uh, although she was accompanied on all tracks by a male singer. Um, but the cover and this other incident um, led to misrepresentations in the media uh, and so some conservative clerics um, in turn believed that Ershad, the Ministry of Culture, had in fact given a permit for solo female singing. Three sources of emulation, the highest clerical rank, close to Khamenei, issued statements attacking the ministry's policies and reiterating that female singing was haram. In response, the director in charge of dissemination of Khamenei's edicts, Muhammad Hossein Fallah Zadeh, was asked to clarify the supreme leader's position uh, on the permissibility of women singing solo in public. In a widely published piece, Fallah Zadeh responded that Ayatollah Khomeini had decreed that if um, the singing is not uh, problematic and this listener does not listen to it with a purpose of pleasure or without sexual innocence, and if it's free of other sources of corruption, it is halal. Um, so on the one hand, this shows perhaps that Khamenei's religious views were on the whole more liberal than that of other conservative ulama. On the other hand, there's so many qualifications inserted into that short edict um, that it eludes any clear deduction and only contributes to the general sense of confusion within the realm of music. It appears that while through the principle of maslahat, expediency, the Islamic Republic official policymaking bodies were able to categorically permit the use, education, production, and distribution of music, even pop, and now, as I said, more recently, also rock music, they're unable to apply the same principle to the female voice. They are unable to fully resolve whether having the solo female voice in the public sphere, having female musicians appear in public media and concerts and sing to mixed gender audiences is in the interests of the state. Or one might conclude, considering that we're entering the fifth decade of the revolution, uh, February 2019 will be the 40th anniversary of the revolution. The revolution is now 39 years old, but considering that we're entering the fifth decade, um, we might conclude that they have shown through their actions that they do not believe that it is in the interests of an Islamic state to allow for the solo female voice to be performed um, in public forum. But expedient or not, women musicians themselves have pushed the boundaries and their solo voices are incre increasingly heard in public spaces. Um, though not in the real public sphere, but more sort of in the virtual sphere, which 
a majority of Iranians partake in through satellite television, internet, and radio stations. Um, there are many great female instrumentalists, and in the last years, also several women ensembles. One of these ensembles, the Mah Ensemble, published, has published many pieces on YouTube. Um, and several years ago, when it published its first pieces, it got a lot of traction in Iran and abroad. It features women, of, um, women all of whom have been studying and practicing music within the given permitted framework of the Islamic Republic. The older singer, Hurvash Khalili, has been on several albums co-singing with others, especially Mali Hissaidi, which is permitted. So co-singing, bi-vocal, uh, singing with another woman, another man, that's considered just solo singing is problematic. But considering the restrictions and utter lack of support of the state, the space they have created is a tribute to their own efforts and vision only. Um, I'm going to show you a short piece of um, this ensemble's work. So I hope um, that you, what I could show today is that the issue of music and its permissibility is an open and constantly evolving one. Um, and I think that this might be a good segue to start a conversation with the Tehran Vocal Ensemble and Mehdi and Milad, who are online to speak with us, who have graciously agreed to participate in our session today. Um, considering that the female tonal range is needed in, in a choir in the absence of musical instruments, um, I thought that this would be a good way of connecting our conversation and then taking it from there with Mehdi and Milad. Thank you. Salam, Mehdi Jan, Milad Jan. I don't think you can see the audience. Um, it's a beautiful room, and uh, there are many in attendance. Um, I have taken a picture, which I will send you. Um, but I just wanted to start the conversation um, there. So you uh, started performing as, an, um, as, a, as a group together about 12 years ago. How did you approach the subject of um, the, the vocal range, uh, vocal range in, your, in your choir and um, the inclusion of women initially? 12 years ago, things were a little more uh, restrictive than, than they are now. A lot has happened in the last 12 years. Uh. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Mehdi, and uh, uh, I'm a former singer of uh, this ensemble. And uh, here is Mila, the, the conductor and the uh, supervisor, and the one who established this uh, ensemble uh, 12 years ago. Uh, the, at that time, uh, uh, you know, uh, singing. Uh, as a uh, uh, singing uh, in a choir uh, uh, was something uh, that uh, we really uh, wanted to do, and uh, uh, and uh, there were uh, many ensembles uh, in uh, uh, Europe and uh, United States uh, that uh, we wanted to do the same thing <laughs> that uh, they do, and. Uh, uh, so uh, at the at the first time uh, we try to uh, uh, collect the, the singers that we required for a 16th uh, member group and uh, 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 and uh, try to, to uh, arrange some pieces uh, for this choir uh, about uh, uh, the uh, female uh, singers. Uh, 
uh, we are uh, somehow sure that uh, women uh, uh, are not allowed and uh, will not be allowed to sing uh, uh, in Iran uh, uh, for uh, for the years that uh, this uh, regime is working. Uh, so uh, uh, many uh, female singers uh, like to sing in choirs because uh, uh, it is uh, totally allowed uh, that uh, women sing together. Uh, the problem is just singing solo. Uh, so uh, fortunately there are many uh, female singers and uh, uh, many high quality uh, female singers in Iran that can uh, sing in the choirs and uh, be uh, used, uh, we have used these voices uh, during these uh, years. Uh, that's it. Uh. Ah, wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit about how you choose your pieces? What kinds of pieces do Iranians like to hear a choir perform? Yes, uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, we just... Uh, uh, we just... Uh, 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 s s uh, selected uh, uh, classical pieces, uh, uh, for example, from uh, Bach and uh, uh, some uh, Mozart and uh, the other uh, classical uh, yeah, composers. And uh, uh, after uh, we uh, uh, we learned how to arrange the pieces uh, for our choir. Uh, we use the Iranian uh, folklores uh, and we arrange them uh, for uh, for this ensemble. Uh, and after that, uh, we went for pop music, jazz music, and uh, uh, movie soundtracks. And uh, we tried uh, to uh, expand the, the field. Uh, the, you know the. Uh, the other uh, uh, genres, uh, uh, musical genres, and uh, uh, we have two albums, uh, which the first one is just uh, Iranian music, and the other one, the second one, is uh, movie soundtracks from uh, all around the world and uh, Iran. So quite a range, actually. and. Um were you one of the very first groups to establish, uh, uh, to be, uh, the, one of the first choir groups um, in Iran? And is it is it more of a uh, thing now, or what what can you tell us about choir culture in Iran? Yes, uh, uh, after the revolution, uh, 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 there were uh, some choirs in Iran active. Uh, uh, the main choir, which uh, has been active uh, for several years, is the TV. That uh, the choir which belongs to TV and radio, the national TV and radio, uh, and uh, the other is uh, belongs to the Iran uh, Music uh, uh, Office, uh, which is uh, which has been working uh, more than uh, twenty years. Uh, there were uh, uh, some choirs active during these years, but. Uh, uh, we, uh, no, Tehran Local Ensemble uh, is, uh, is an a cappella choir, and uh, we believe that we are a vocal ensemble uh, more than uh, to be a choir. Uh, so uh, um, we, we believe that uh, we are the first vocal ensemble uh, in Iran, and after uh, we, uh, you know, uh, uh, we were more active and we performed uh, several concerts and after some years uh, other vocal ensembles uh, in Iran started to work and they came here and uh, we were uh, connected together and uh, uh, so uh, no, uh, I, I think uh, in uh, these uh, t uh, 10 or 12 years that uh, we are working uh, the number of uh, choirs uh, are uh, increased and uh, there are now there are many people uh, 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 more people uh, that uh, like to sing in choirs so uh, we would love to hear uh, your performance what pieces have you prepared yes uh, 
we perform uh, two pieces uh, for uh, for the audience. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, the first one is uh, called Sorry uh, Gary. It's a famous uh, uh, folklore uh, which belongs to Iran, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Turkey. <laughs> Uh, and, it means uh, white bride, right? It's about a bride. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's the yellow. yellow bride. The meaning is yellow yeah. bride. Uh -huh, okay. And uh, uh, the arrangement uh, is by uh, Bilat. And uh, the other, uh, the second uh, uh, song uh, is the famous uh, uh, song of the uh, Friends series that... Uh, uh, I know everybody Friends knows that. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. بچه ها اگه یه ذره بتونیم بیایم به سمت راستتون همه از یه ذره حتی یلدا اگه بتونه بیاد بیایم اینجا که شما هم یه ذره اگه قوس بدین که نه خوبه یه ذره دیگه محکول خیلی فشرده است نه الان خوبه نه میخوام که آره میلاد بیا بایسا من خوبه میتونی از بیا عقب تر میلاد